Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate y'all inviting me tonight uh, into, into your homes. I, I love demonstrating. Uh, I love sharing my, my information. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about chucking wood. Uh, I've done this demo a couple of times before, and it's got a lot of moving parts to it. But uh, Alan asked me to also do some turning, and, and, and I think that was a good idea because it makes it a little more real when we talk about chucking uh, and we actually have something real to deal with. Let me show you is we're going to turn a couple of pieces, but we're going to start off with with one a, a little multi multi axis uh birdhouse ornament similar similar to this. We little we're not going to do the miniature bird, but uh that's that's turned. That's a that's a fun little little thing to to deal with. We're going to start off turning between centers, and I want to talk a little bit about about uh, drives first. There's generally most of the the lays will come with a drive. There we go, a four four prong spur. I don't much care for these. This is the one that came with my li little uh, Laguna Midi because you have to hammer them in. But I encourage you, if you do have one, to use it. Go ahead and and sharpen it with it's fairly soft metal. Use a file and sharpen it a little bit. Uh, the other one that sometimes comes with lays are the two-prong uh, drives. I like this better, especially for uh, natural edge bowls and and some larger larger green projects. But again, you have to get, uh, hammer hammer it in. Don't use a a steel hammer, but use a a mallet of some sort so you don't mushroom the the end of it. What I like to use is is a step center, uh, similar. I've got I've got four different four different, well, actually, I got five different models. Uh, the, and when it, comes to, when it comes to chucking, there's, you know, there's a lot of different factors that involved how we go about chucking. One of them certainly is cost. Uh, and, and when it comes to these live centers, the how much you pay for it does make a difference. You can get a Robert Sorby uh, such as these that... Uh, cost a lot more than the cheaper house brands, whether it's Craft Supply or Wood River or whoever selling there. But these are about twenty bucks. But they've got a they've got a screw on the side. Sooner or later, it comes loose, and once it does, you start having pro problems with it. I'd say if you do have one, go ahead and take the screw and put some Loctite in it, so it it hopefully won't come loose. If you ever lose the point, you, you're kind of out of luck because these cheap ones, uh, that's not a replaceable item unless you know I'm a machinist. But these little teeth bite into the wood, uh, and, it, and they work real well. The cheaper ones come in a, a smaller and a larger size. The Robert Sorby comes in, to, in a, a small, medium, and large size. I tend to like this smaller one that's a half inch. This other one is a seven eighths inch, and they've got one even larger. But the larger ones I don't fi find real helpful. If you try to turn a bowl with a large one like this, it tends to chew in, chew a hole. Does it does not work as well on a green bowl as as the the uh, the two prong <laughs> two prong chuck uh, drive center. So we're going to go ahead and use use this one and just pop it into place. The next thing when you turn between centers is going to be the live live center. Uh, I use this one that came with my Powermatic. I like it. It's it's nice. It also comes with a 60 degree cone, but I find that it's a it's a soft aluminum. Once your tool touches it, it tends to mess it up, and it's also kind of a pain to to take this thing on and off. You've got to use this little spindly rod that comes with it and there's several of them i say the one that comes with a pyromatic also comes with a large jet uh the one way this is a knockoff of the one way the, the features are the same same size three quarter by ten threads same kind of i think uh, uh flimsy knockout bar that tends to get get bent but it you stick it in here to stop this thing from turning if you're going to put that 60 degree cone on and off when it comes to a 60 degree cone I'd prefer just, uh, you know, one alternative is buying an inexpensive one, a Chinese one, 
Uh, I think it only has like one bearing, whereas these nicer ones have a couple of bearings, so they tend to hold up better long term. That said, though, I've been using this one for over 12 years. It's it's running just fine. So anytime I need a 60-degree cone, I generally uh, get this cheap one. In the United States, these sell for somewhere around $18 or $19 or so on Amazon or some of the various wood-turning wood turning vendors. Um, the other one that tends to come with a lot of lathes looks something like this. I don't care for the shape or design. It's so big that you can't get in close to the work. Uh, one way you can resolve that, though, is just turn you, and it's not a 60-degree cone, but you can turn you a 60-degree cone, uh, just chuck up a piece of wood, uh, hollow out a hole that will fit. doesn't have to be a super uh, tight fit. And turn a cone. Doesn't even have to be 60 degrees. Just some kind of pointed cone, uh, if you need it. And then if your tool touches it, not a not a big deal. You can always always make another one. So we're going to move this display out of the way. We're going to start off with a piece of wood for the the roof, and this is about two and a quarter by two and a quarter by three inches. Uh, sometimes I'm a metric guy, but most of the time I'm imperial, unless I'm doing fine measurements. And then I like to use millimeter because, as we know, it's a heck of a lot easier to figure out what the half of 97 millimeters is instead of trying to figure out the half of 2 and 7 eighths or what, what have you. So we're going to turn that between centers. I'm going to use a small tool rest. And I'm going to do this twin centers with a spindle roughing gouge. Uh, the tool, you know, if you if you grind it straight across, you, you're going to find you've got a much more versatile tool than if you round the edges uh, red edges over. So we're going to turn this at a fairly high speed. Capture twin centers, very safe. Anchor the tool, ride the bevel, lift the handle till it cuts. Tighten it up if it spins on you. Turn this around, use all the edge. Now, depending on the size of the wood and your chuck, a lot of times before I get it completely round, I like to mark where the tenon needs to go because the, the key to uh, chucking this thing is a really good shoulder. So, and so I've got a good quarter inch so I can go ahead and finish getting it to round or close to it. This tool rest is actually a little bit, it's a nice tool rest, it's robust. It's got a hardened rod on it so it holds up real well but it's a little bit shorter. So let's Go with this shop made one here. We're going to put a tenon on this end. This thing, we're going to bring this to kind of a, I don't know what you call it. Not a triangle, but a whatever. Just wasting some of the wood. Now I'm going to go ahead and put a tenon on it. I'm going to use, you can use a parting tool. I like to use a beading and parting tool because uh, I can make a wider tenon in one pass. If you use a smaller one, for example, like a, this shop made 1 8 inch, you have to take multiple passes. Sometimes for a beginner that's a little bit of an effort and they don't get as, as nice as smooth a tenon. This is uh, 8 millimeter. Now let's talk about tenons a little bit. It's the crucial thing about a tenon is is it needs to be appropriate for your chuck. That cat that uh, camera is a little cattywampus. Let bear with me here while I try to square this thing up. It needs to be appropriate for your particular chuck. Uh, I'm using a I tend to use Record Power and Techna Tool, which for their standard jaws they use a parallel tenon. Uh, your one-way talon. Same thing, uses a, a parallel jaw set. 
uh, or, or tenon as opposed to a dovetail. I know for folks that buy Technotool, a lot of times they, they see the term dovetail and without reading the instructions, they make a dovetail and then they complain about why they don't get a good hold. But the critical thing is, is it's got to actually be parallel if it requires a parallel. That means 90 degrees for this shoulder with no, no uh, debris wow. down here in the corner. It's got to be neat and clean. And sometimes I think we forget when we've been turning a while that what's obvious to us is not obvious to begin. I was in a workshop here a few weeks ago, and, and somebody didn't have a parallel shoulder after I told them. And I said, it's not parallel. And they looked at it and says, well, it looks parallel. And it's like, no, it's sloping. And, and they had to look at it a couple of times before they realized, and I'm not sure they were convinced, but all I had to do was put it in a chuck form and show them that they had a gap and... why that was an issue. So I made a, a fairly deep tenon. This is deeper than I would normally uh, make. Tenons don't have to be that uh, normally that, that deep. Let me give you an example of one. This little, little bitty bowl, this thing's not even, oh, it's less than an eighth less than an eighth of an inch, and it works just fine on this small little little saucer. Bigger pieces, you might want a little bit more for margin. So we're going to knock this thing out and put on a chuck. So I'm going to grab this, this Techna tool. I really like the, uh, the, the normal jaw set that comes with the Techna tool, but apparently they, they must have gotten an awful lot of flack over the years because I see they're beginning, it looks like they're throwing in the towel and coming up with a new improved chuck, uh, uh, chuck normal chuck jaws that are a dovetail. So, the key is, let me, I can probably increase the magnification of that just a bit. Another important consideration is that it should not bottom out. If it bottoms out, it's going to leverage you on the bottom, and you're going to have a problem. Now, we're going to do this thing multi-axis, but before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and take it a little bit more down I'm just wasting wood bowl gouges I mean uh, spindle gouges will not remove as wood as fast as a bowl gouge but that's okay. So I'm going to take my birdhouse and, and a pencil, and we're just going to kind of use this as a storyboard and, and mark it. So that's just about lined up. That's going to be just about the bottom. Because I'm going to have to put another, another tenon on here to fit, uh, to fit inside the birdhouse. Now, I've turned, I've already turned the base, because we don't have time to go through this whole thing, but I've turned the base. I've got a one-inch hole drilled in it, so I'll be able to uh, test fit it. But we're going to take this, uh, put a secondary tenon on here for one inch before we part it off. All right, so here's the trick to this thing. And it's just not really that tricky. I was amazed the first time I saw this. This is Frank Penta, North Carolina. One of the most uh, enthusiastic wood turner demonstrators I've, I've, I've run across. So I'm going to go to the number one position. And I'm just going to cock this thing. I'm going to open it up, oh, maybe an eighth of an inch. And down on the other side, it's still touching. And the jaws are biting into it. And this is why this particular chuck design works real well. Because it has what they call a micro uh, a micro dovetail. Here's a small one by Record Power that uses the same design. Uh, they might call this, a, somebody referred to it as a hawk, hawk tooth. But it's a very, very miniature. You don't really hollow uh, a cut the dovetail. It actually bites into the wood. So that works out real well for this. So 
we've got that thing cocked. We've got it. Uh, we want to make sure it's nice and snug. We're going to do it a couple of times. And now we're just going to uh, turn the end of this. So it's wobbling a little bit. Uh, we can turn the speed up. Speed is our friend on this multi-axis. So I'm going to kind of take it easy, ease it into it. If I got too aggressive, I could probably pull this out of the chuck. And then we're going to have to stop and check our work periodically to see how we're doing. And I've got a little bit of torn wood. What? Uh, I'm turning right now at about um, 1600. I could I could speed it up a little bit more. I'm going to slow the feed rate down. I got just a little bit of tear out, and I'm hoping that will clear it up. This is some spalted. Um, Bradford pear, which is a wood that generally doesn't spalt a whole lot. And yeah, that'll that'll probably work. Now I'm going to take another adjustment. So we're going to go back, and this time we're going to move to the, the between the number two jaws. So I put it back in place and then just pull it out a little bit in the middle, the middle of that chuck jaw, about an eighth of an inch. Again, tighten it down. Tighten it down, and just on the fore side, you can see it's still in contact. So now we're going to get get that axis off a little bit, and we're going to step back a little bit. It's it, it, it. This is a kind of a fun project to play with a little bit to see what you're going to get after you lock it in place. You always stop, turn this thing, then just to make sure. That it's not going to hit that tool rest because that wouldn't be pretty. So I'm coming off, oh, maybe five eighths of an inch from the end. Nothing magic there. Just easing it in. And we see a little bit of a ghost shadow so I can see where the wood is so I don't cut it too far. Now I'm going to come in from the other direction, oh, maybe another five eighths or half inch down down the the top now you need to sand before you change I didn't sand the end of this like I should have and I'm not going to sand during this demo anyway uh, but you when you're doing it for real sand it before you change the axis so I want to cut in a little bit deeper that's a little bit thick Anchor the tool, ride the bevel, ease into the cut. Roll it over a little bit. And that's looking that's looking about what I what I was hoping for. Now we're going to turn it one more time to number number 3. So we get it flat, and then we open it up in the middle of that three. I'm using a, a three-eighths inch spindle gouge. Probably a half inch might give me a little more, uh, a little more beam strength. You can say. So here's the edge of that cut. So I'm going to pick up the cut a little bit higher than that, where the where the cut ends. Come in from the other direction. Just wasting a little wood here. Carefully. Coming in from the other direction. This multi-axis approach also does real well for hats on this uh, 
this real popular ornament that people turn nowadays, the gonks or Nordic nissies or, or whatever you want to call them. Yeah, that doesn't look too bad. I could probably go just a little bit deeper. I think to go a little bit deeper, I'm going to switch to a detail gouge. Now, this detail gouge is the same size as this 3 8 inch normal spindle gouge. These are both by Doug Thompson. The difference is this one is only milled uh, about one-third deep. This is milled 50% deep. So as a result, there's a lot more steel under this one. And when you grind it, because of the nature of the way the flute is ground, it tends to be a little pointier, and I tend to bring it, make it a little more swept back. But that way I can go in a little deeper without catching the wing on the other side, and it's got uh, fairly good strength. I think I was doing that on my third position and really didn't mean to. I meant to cut in next to it. So I'm going to pick up the cut here. Let's see what that looks like. Not too bad. I'd like to go a little bit deeper. I'm going to come in straight in with the, 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 the bottom of the flute at, at perpendicular to the axis of the wood. Straight in. Slowly open it up just a little bit. And then come in from the other direction into the bottom of that V, trying to get as nice and smooth a cut as possible so sanding won't be an issue. I could probably go one more time, but I'm not, gonna, not going to because I don't have that much wood down here at the bottom, and I'm going to shape the bottom. I could have shaped that at the beginning. I usually do, but I forgot this time. So when I have a pencil mark, what I like to do is use a parting tool, uh, usually early on, to mark where that pencil mark is, because you touch the pencil mark and it's gone. Now the downside of that is you tend to get committed once you make a parting cut for a number of things, but... And now we're just going to slightly round over the edge of that roof line just a little bit. And then we're going to come in, oh, maybe halfway. Now we're on center this time. And then I'm going to come in a little bit more. And then I'm going to step back, come in one more time. Maybe concave it just a little bit. I don't want to get crazy about this thing. And, and I'm fairly satisfied with that. I've got just a little bit of tear out here. I could probably clean that up just a little bit. This Bradford pear is just beautiful uh, turning wood. It, you can actually thread it. And this, is, this piece has got a little bit of spalting in it, which is generally, like I mentioned, a little unusual down here. All right, so... Now we've got it. Now all we've got to do is put a tenon on the end of it. And so I'm going to go back to that, uh, this beading and parting tool. This is a great, a great club project. This is a shop-made version. You can get this, these high-speed steel blanks used in the metal industry. This is 8 by 8 by 200 uh, uh, milli, uh, millimeter. So it's a, you know, a little less than an eighth of an inch. But actually, it's about five sixteenths of an inch by about eight inches long. And you just slap it in a handle and, and grind it, and you got you a nice parting tool at very little cost. Uh, I've got these on my Amazon shop, but I checked the Amazon Canada, and you can get these things on, on the Amazon Canada. They, they're a little bit more because of the shipping, but they're available. Wood's kind of hard. Uh, 
I don't want to get too much steel on the wood, so I'm going to go ahead and resort back to uh, an eighth of an inch. And before I get too carried away, I need to get my calipers out because I want this to be be one inch or 25 millimeter for you metric folks. But the main thing is it's got to match your drill bit because this the body of this thing is actually uh, drilled out uh, for this size. It's not worth trying to hollow when you can uh, drill. And I've, I was able to procure at a very reasonable price a nice high speed steel uh, drill bit. And so I use that for my starter hole for uh, hollow forms, and, and it's great for a number of projects like, like this. So, all right, I can come down a little bit more, but not too much. Just using this as a little skew almost. Now, I've got... This is flat on the, on this side, and I really want it to taper. I could do that with a spindle gouge, but I could probably do it with this parting tool as well. Just so we've got a, a little better roof line when it gets on the, uh, on the ornament. Okay. Like turning the box, sometimes you don't want to get too pa impatient. So I'm going to come down and come down a little bit further here and measure it to successful approximation. If this is close here, so this is a little bit loose, so I, I can tell by looking at two, I don't have very far to go at all. So I'm going to taper this down just a little bit toward that wide area and then slide this in and see how I'm doing. And this is just about right on the money. So now I'm going to go ahead and part this off. And it doesn't have to be a long tenant. It's just going to fit in that birdhouse. So, you know, somewhere a little more than an eighth of an inch maybe. And we alternate back and forth so it doesn't bind on us. You just go all the way down with one parting tool and bad things can happen. So I'm going to reach across and grab this thing. Actually... I've got a little bit of a benign tremor in my hand, so that doesn't always work, but it'll just snap right off. Uh, I can remember one taxpayer came in, was couldn't sign her name, and she said, they call this a benign tremor. And she says, I don't know how benign it is if I can't even sign my name with my right hand. So kind of felt sorry for her, but sometimes that's the way things are. Okay, now let's see if it will fit. And it's a little little bit snug. So there's a couple of ways of dealing with that. The easiest way is because I've still got the tenon on here, because I was going to turn the bottom of this, show you another checking method, the jam chuck. I'm just going to put it back in here. And I can come in there with with a scraper or a bowl gouge or almost anything and just just open that area up just a little bit now let me get rid of this live center before i get turner's elbow I'm just going to come in there and move that back and just lower the tool rest uh i used a uh electric uh cordless cordless drill to drill these holes right here the key to these things is, is marking the hole with an awl. Uh, if you mark it with an awl, now this one, a little bit harder. Uh, if you have a, um, a, 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 what do you call it, not a Brad, is it Brad Point? Brad Point uh, drill, it tends to track a little bit better. I used a stubby 5 16ths inch that I use for bottle stoppers little short one and it'll have a tendency if you're not careful to to kind of uh, root it out a little bit but the key is is at least marking it and and that tends to work fairly well yes uh, at least at least be yes before you actually for this ornament it doesn't make a lot of difference but yeah you'll get some tear out on the back side but for this it's really not going to make a lot of difference because you're not going to be able to see it 
it is it does cause you to have to sand a little bit so if you drill it when it's solid you're probably a little better off you don't get all those little shards of of uh, tear out when it busts through that you've got to really sand here to get rid of all those so yeah that's a that's a good point And if it's a little bit loose, it won't make any difference. I tend to use carpenter's glue, not CA glue. Yeah, that works fine. Um, and then I decorated this with a uh, a Wagner uh, knurling, knurling tool. So the next thing I want to show you was uh, a jam chuck. Jam chucks are just wonderful ways to to do so many different projects. And it's one of those things, the more you use them, the more confident you get in using them. And I'm just going to use, I keep these little spindle scraps that have tenons already on them. When I part something off, I throw them in a box. The tenon's already there. Uh, I overshot this a little bit, so I put a little piece of tape on it. And that'll be, oops. Now that I've opened this up a little bit more, that's probably not the one I want to use. So I'll, that just allows me to introduce you to another project and that's using a wooden mandrel that you can turn with a with a morse taper they're not hard to turn they're handy for a lot of projects you just pop it in and this is a little bit larger and this will be snug and this will work i think pretty well i'm going to tap that in just a little bit not so much that it'll split it let's see if it's running true um, true enough. I'm going to bring up the uh, a 60 degree cone. Since I've got a little hole in here, I might as well take advantage of it. Now, the downside of the 60 degree cone is that it acts as a wedge. So for some projects, especially very, very small, thin strips of exotic wood that are very brittle it might have a tendency to split it so you got to keep that in mind it'll also follow seasonal grain so you kind of kind of watch that i'm gonna get this piece of cardboard out of here because it's too hard to maneuver around but just lets it a little easier to see sometimes so this holds it in place uh and we're just going to waste some wood this is just turning a little finial at the end I'm just going to round the bottom of this and then come back here and just kind of bring in that detail just a little bit. And then we're not going to get real fancy with the bottom of this, but just add just a little bit of tiny little detail. And now I'm going to back this off. I've got just a tiny little bit of damage there. Now, if I'm not careful, this will pull out. So I've got to be kind of very gentle. Sharp tools, small cuts. As I get rid of that little bit of a hole that was... Oop, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. Well. In this case, the hole... Old thing's coming loose. Now it's probably not going to run true. Ah, true enough. Still wanting to come out. But I'm pushing the bevel against it to keep it in place while I turn off the bottom. So... As I mentioned, there's there's several considerations to chucking. One of them is cost. I'm trying to fight this thing loose. Okay. Uh, the other one, you know, I've always been kind of frugal, but sometimes if you buy cheap, you buy buy twice. Uh, the other is convenience. Uh, for some people, it's why buy something I can make, and other people, it's like why make something I can buy. It, it depends on, there's no right, right or wrong. It's whatever your value system is and what you enjoy. Uh, speed, some chucking uh, methods are faster than others. 
Uh, time is money, but wait, this is a hobby. So as long as you're enjoying it, it doesn't make a lot of difference. Safety is a factor on some of the chucking mechanisms. Let me just put. The so now I'm going to turn a walnut perch using a, a collet chuck. I'll talk more about this this later. Here's my storage system. I have a lot of extra spare spare collets, which makes it a lot easier to to, to size. Um, and generally works best for round wood, but I can also put in small squares, and that, that does, does fine. And I'm turning it the, <laughs> the, the part that goes into the birdhouse uh, on the outside because it makes it easier to check the size. But it's so about 16th or 330 seconds of an inch uh, thick. And I use my workhorse 3 8 inch spindle gouge to shape it. Uh, you want it about a half an inch long projecting from the birdhouse ornament. I used to buy these little uh, birds uh, and glue on the perch, but I've since then I've started turning smaller birds out of wood and and, and mounting them on the roof line. It seems to uh, work very well. And this particular one that I bought from Craft Supply USA, it's actually uh, one and a quarter. You can get uh, ones from Penn State. I don't know whether y'all get some stuff from Penn State or not. They sell one that looks like it's probably made out of, comes from the same factory, but it's it's uh, only a one inch. And I find that this uh, this one and, a, one and a quarter actually comes with an insert. Let me grab that thing. And let me talk a little bit. Let me talk just briefly about inserts and, and adapters. I, we didn't talk too much about chucks on the front on on the front end. But chucks, some of them come with adapters, so you can buy one and buy an adapter to fit. Some of them are direct threaded, such as this Technotool Precision MIDI, and it's direct threaded for one inch, so I have this spindle adapter on it. So I can put it on this lathe with a different set of chuck jaws. Let me grab a pair of pliers, see if I can't break that thing loose, because I want to show you this spindle adapter. New turners sometimes get confused between these terms, spindle adapters and inserts. What's the difference? And is there an advantage one over the other? And I'd say, yes, generally speaking, you want a chuck with an adapter that's going to fit that lathe. But that said, uh, you can buy you a nice spindle adapter, and actually some of the less expensive ones tend to run fairly true that that been in my experience, but you can take it in and actually just thread on a direct threaded chuck where, where you can't change out the adapter, and then put it on a different size, size lathe. Now with this particular collet chuck that I've got, for uh, threaded for one and a quarter, it actually comes with an insert that adapts to to one inch, and it's really pretty amazing. It's so inexpensive, and when this one with this versatility is the same price as one that's direct threaded for one inch, I find this one nicer because this this adapter that goes in here now this will fit on a on a one inch. Uh, uh, I've got a teaching lathe that's uh, a midi lathe. And, and it works just fine, and it doesn't extend out very far like that spindle adapter I showed you that, you know, tends to probably, the longer the adapter is, the more likelihood of a run out. I haven't had any real problems, and a lot of times this is wood anyway. It's not a big issue, but, but this is a handy little thing to have. So, but... One of the nice things about this collet chuck for production work, I put a long stick in there, I loosen it up, I pull this out, and I'm ready to turn the next perch. I turn that one off, I pull it out a little bit more and turn the next perch, and so on. And you can have this thing go all the way back into your 
Uh, headstock, you know, I don't know, if depends on the size of your headstock, but it could easily go back there a foot or, or more uh, when you get into production turning, like turning those little birds or, or perches. So I didn't talk too much about chucks, but it goes back to uh, that factor I talked about cost. If you're a new turner, um, sometimes, you, you know, you got a limited budget, and I understand that, and sometimes you got to make do. Maybe your, your, uh, your family CFO won't authorize you to spend as much money as you would like, but there's different kinds of chucks, and it's, they're mostly a function of quality. It's a direct, almost a direct relationship with, with the cost. Uh, Bear with me. Uh, the, the audience in this demo didn't have any trouble hearing me. Uh, the mic came through all the time, but unfortunately, when I recorded it, I lost some of the sound. Every time I changed from an overhead mic to another view, I didn't get sound. So I'm, I edited some of those out and doing voiceover so, uh, for the others. So just uh, bear with me here. I'm talking a little bit about chucks here and basically I'm explaining that my view is the whether they have a closed back or not is more of a personal choice. It's not really a, a big deal. Reference, I have this inexpensive Technotool G3, or actually this is a record power uh, that looks just like a G3. It's an open back. Your, your one-way stronghold and talon are op open back versus a lot of chucks like the Vic Mark and the Technic Tool and Record Power, they're closed back. Frankly, I don't see that there's any real difference. As long as you blow it out and clean it, uh, they're both going to do just fine. One's not inherently superior, I don't think, to another one. Um, but at least that's, that's my thought. Bigger chucks for bigger projects, smaller chucks for smaller projects. Uh, any, anybody got any questions on chucks? I don't know that I got a monopoly on truth, but I've got my opinion. <laughs> All right, the next thing I wanted to, oh, jam chucks. But we talked briefly about jam chucks, and I want to give you some other examples of, of jam chucks. You can, you can finish turning a bowl with a jam chuck. You just got to have a, a pretty good size blank to put it in. But a lot of times you can use a bowl blank. This is just a scrap of, uh, I don't know, poplar, I think, uh, that was originally green and it dried out. And I turned this thing probably eight years ago. And the bowl was dry. The wood always, we know wood moves, but generally speaking, uh, I mean, this thing will still run true and pop in there. And I could still finish off the bottom of a bowl using this this technique and this one will still run run true that's one method what's one style of jam chuck the one we see most often is when we're making a box and typically you'll have a box and you'll have the base mounted on a chuck and you'll have you'll have already worked on the lid but to finish the lid you've got to figure out how to hold it and the best way to hold it is a jam chuck and you just you just make it real snug. Before you finish the box, though, you've got to fine-tune that tenon a little bit to loosen it up a little bit because you want it very snug when you're finishing the box. But before you finish the thing, you want this thing a fairly loose fit. Turners like to, you know, have them really pop loose. The ladies that be, are the ones that are usually the recipients or the purchasers, they want them generally a one-handed operation. So you want a, not a sloppy tenon, but one that doesn't take necessarily take two hands. Uh, another type of jam chuck, and I went for years and never used this, and then I thought I'd give it a try, and that's if you turn eggs. Uh, this is an easy way to finish off the end of an egg. <clears throat> this is in there pretty, pretty snug. The trick is if you're using it for eggs, <clears throat> what, you wanted, what I like to do is, is turn off the fat end first, Bring this down, and then you want to leave a tiny little stem here so when you do put it in a chuck to finish off the end for shaping and, and sanding, you can use that little tip there to actually get it centered. And, and then this will, this, this will hold it just amazingly well. And you, can, you can put it in either side, and you can do them for spheres the same way. Any questions on jam chucks? 
Uh, one thing I guess I probably ought to mention on jam chuck, there is a secret to it. Boy, you can see how snug this thing is. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt to have a hole in the end of it. So if you get it stuck in there, you can take a dowel on the back side and, you know, pop it, pop it loose. Don't want to drop my egg and break it here. Um, you want to make this slightly tapered. When I say slightly, about three degrees. Now, where does the three degrees come from? Well, it comes from Ernie Conover, who wrote a, wrote a book, uh, a very skilled wood, wood turner. But also, three degrees is, is the slope you find on your, your Morse tapers whether you turn one or whether you got got one, three, three degrees. And that allows it to be wedged in there and hold uh, very, very well. Okay, uh, another, collet, another collet chuck, and this is, introduces a concept of threaded glue box. These are just really handy. Uh, once you make a bunch of these, they last almost forever. They run true. You can put uh, glue a box on the thing and take it on and off, which is great if you're doing thread chasing, and it'll always run true. But here's just an example of one that I got from a uh, 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 former Canadian wood turner, passed away, uh, uh, Bob Hamilton, one of my uh, early YouTube he uh, heroes. And you've got this thing hollowed out, then you got uh, four slits on it, and this is an example if you were doing uh, bracelets, but, or in this case, um, napkin rings, you pop it on, and then you bring up your 60-degree cone and snug it in, and that tightens the thing up so you can do the outside of it. Lots of, lots of things you can do with a collet chuck, and lots of things you can do with these threaded glue blocks. They're easy to make. You get a... a the taps can be kind of pricey, but I found the cheapest tap is, is one by John Beal. It has the Beal buffing system. Uh, he makes them fair, re, very reasonable. He's got one that's one and a quarter, and he's got one that's one inch. And once you invest in this, you, you, you can uh, just make all the threaded, threaded blocks you need. And I use these things. We can talk about that later if we have time. But for making, for example, my vacuum... Uh, vacuum chucks, they're all threaded glue blocks. And I use them for any number of different different things. All right, so we talked about mandrels. Let's talk a little bit about commercial mandrels. There's the there's this threaded 3 8 inch mandrel that's made for bottle stoppers. This is by Ruth Niles. Uh, and it's self-tapping, so you drill a 5 16 inch hole, and you can actually tap the, the block on here and then thread the, her uh, stainless steel uh, bottle stopper in it. That's a commercial mandrel. Uh, so one of the, the things that, that I, like to, I like to make occasionally, I like to do a lot of small stuff. Sometimes it, I do a few, and then I go off and do something else because... I don't like to do it all day long or every day, but that's uh, fan pulls. So we're gonna put that on there. This is a dab, and we're gonna. You can use whatever set of chuck jaws will <coughs> hold that small blank. In this case, I'm using these pen jaws, which is uh, <coughs> great for drilling holes on on pen blanks. Whoop! Don't want to use that one. But it's also great for uh, drilling holes uh, of almost anything. So this is a piece of Osage orange or Beau Dark. That's probably what y'all call it, Beau Dark, with the French trapper heritage. So the key is you you drill a hole, and first thing we're going to do is we're going to face this off. So I'm just going to get this a high speed. Brace it my little finger in case it kicks back on me. And then taper it in a little bit. I cut all my blanks on a, on a uh, bandsaw, and I've got a fence, and I, I, 
I'd do a lot better with this bandsaw now that's got a fence to it. Now, we want to make a little tiny dimple there. I didn't get the dimple, so we're going to resort to using a skew to make sure that that absolutely has a dimple because for doing these, you can drill these things with a uh, drill chuck, but what I have found that a whole lot faster is you make you a little a pair of hand drills. They don't even need a ferrule on because they're not getting any lateral lateral pressure. And you start off with a a five sixteenth inch. When you a lot of times when you go to buying these um, beaded chain, uh, and I noticed Craft Supply that they they their instructions call for a quarter inch hole and a one eighth inch hole. But what I found is that most of the time the chain will not go, a one eighth inch chain will not go through a one eighth inch hole. So we're gonna just come in here and go down maybe, oh, three eighths of an inch or so. Now we've got a little dimple at the bottom. So I'm just gonna come in here with this nine sixteenths. And then I'm going to turn it around. Now, there is a trick to turning this thing around because a lot of times my blanks are not perfectly square. So to kind of, I want to try to keep this thing in the same orientation. And sometimes I forget to do that, but it's a good idea when I do. And I hate this, I hate these Tommy bar chucks because I never can get them going the right direction. So the trick is we're going to pull this thing out and spin it exactly 180 degrees so we keep that same orientation if it's not quite square. And that will make a difference. But these Tommy bars, it this is still a very nice precision chuck, this uh, Technotool chuck. I just find that it, I wind up dropping these things all the time. So on this one, we got to, again, face this off just a little bit. Tapered in just a little bit. And I think that's probably close enough without resorting to a skew. Now I'm going to use the 9 16 and hopefully this should meet in the middle. And there it is. So now we've got it drilled. Now we put it between centers with a mandrel. And this is where one of those Morse taper mandrels works, uh, works great. And that's what I used for years until I watched a, a, a YouTube video with uh, Colwin, Colwin Way on the Axminster Ax site. Uh, he does a great job with his, with his demonstrations. And he was showing this Axminster fan pull, uh, fan pull mandrel. And I thought, yeah, I think I'll get one of those. Well, it turns out supply chain disruption during COVID, and that thing was out of stock, uh, not available in England, Canada, United States, any vendor for about three or four months. So now we've got this thing ready to go. So I'm going to take just a second and find where I have my, my Axminster mandrel. Somewhere, but if I can't find it, I will just resort to using a my wooden mandrel. Now I found for me, you can get these uh, the the beaded chains uh, in in pieces from lots of different vendors. The trick that I found, or the hard part, is finding is getting one that is has some kind of knob on the end of it like like this big knob that won't so it won't pull through uh it's easy enough to find the chain and it's easy enough to find the little the little connectors uh, i get this in, there we go those those little connectors that go on a chain but you need some way to to keep it from pulling pulling through the ones from Craft Supply come with this nice ball. Sometimes you might find a hardware store that's got all these little pieces that you can you can buy, especially the older hardware stores, which we're having a harder time finding those things. So 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 what we're trying to do is just 
turn a little fan pull, something like this. Doesn't have to be real complicated. I like to turn when I turn them. I like to turn them in fan in in pairs. So one goes to the light, one goes to a fan, uh, tied together with a string. And I like to have them slightly different in size and shape. Uh, and that's just the way I do it. So here's the mandrel that I'm going to use that I turned. And then we're just going to use this 60 degree cone on the other end. And this fits in here. And this fits in here. Tighten it up and then it's nice and snug. And this one, you can turn this thing at a very high speed. And we're just going to rough it out. Tighten it up a little bit if it slips. Not too, don't press too hard. Now I'm going to go back to that uh, 3 8 inch spindle gouge, and I'm just going to make a round ball at the end, although I don't think I've got this thing round yet. Turn your sketch out some designs, or get on get on Pinterest and find some that you like. I have a couple of Pinterest boards I store my ideas on when I find them. Maybe turn a little bead at the end. And you can put a friction polish on it or antique oil or whatever. You, you get the idea. They're, they're a lot of fun and they make uh, very quick and, and uh, inexpensive, easy to easy to make gifts. Now the other uh, chucking method I want to show you is what I use to use to do uh, chess men. I started turning some chess sets a few years ago and I find them a lot of a lot of fun. I sent one off to a, a great nephew the other day uh, that I, I met at a family reunion for the first time that got real interested in chess and I I about decided my two granddaughters, I was making two heirloom sets, one for each of them, because they both played a little chess with me, but I found out quickly that it, it, it lo they lost interest in it pretty quick, and they weren't that really all that interested in playing chess, so I didn't, didn't figure they were really going to care that much for a chess, chess set down the road, so I sent one off to my great-nephew, who beat me at chess recently at this family reunion, and I know he'll appreciate it. All right, so we're going to take this this little jam chuck, or 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 you call it a mandrel. Mandrel is a round thing that sticks out that you mount things on. Uh, there's a little more technical definition, but it's not a lot more technical than that. This technique, though, using a uh, a, a a woodworm a a screw chuck is very fast for a lot of small produ uh, production kind of when you turn on a bunch at high speed uh, this works great for for chess men and let's see yeah so we're gonna we're gonna turn a little rook uh, this is a Russian design which I really like because it doesn't they don't even bother to put crenellations on it very simple style very kind of elegant looking and cutting those crenellations is a real pain, so I like this design. The, the, what it, so what I've done is, is just taken a spindle scrap, used a center drill to make sure I've got that, that center hole marked. I use a, an appropriate size um, screw, and actually you can't really mount it completely on here without a screwdriver. 
And early in my woodworking uh, career, I discovered these square square drives that I found out uh, very quickly that y'all tend to, I think, use these pretty much exclusively in Canada, these Robertson screws, and I really love it for wood uh, woodworking, so I, I buy all my screws square head. So you just put this in, in. by the way, this has got two holes. It's got a three-quarter inch hole, and it's five pennies deep. I put five pennies in for a weight, and then I have an extra uh, a penny depth so I can put a little epoxy in there to hold it. And that, that gives it a little more elegant feel. So you put that on. And then uh, also I've got a, uh, similar to the way I did the uh, drill the holes for the, the fan pull, I use a hand drill, uh, a little one-eighth inch. And because you've already got that, that uh, hole left from your Forstner, Forstner bit, it just goes in there very easily. And sometimes I do that as a separate operation off the lathe with a uh, a hand drill. Sometimes I do it on a lathe. But you just tighten this thing up a little bit. And this will hold it amazingly strong as long as you don't get the piece too far out and don't leverage it too much. Sometimes when you get out to the kings and queens, you might want to bring up some tailstock support. So, it has two different steps, this particular one. One's marked 26 millimeter, one is marked 32. The inner one is 26. So, what that allows you to do, if you size your blanks for a chest set, it may be one eighth inch larger uh, in each direction. That'll give you plenty of slack. All you have to do, basically, is turn it round. Once you turn it around, you don't really have to worry about sizing it if you size your blanks uh, very carefully, preferably with a, maybe a table saw, but you could do it on a bandsaw as well. And I have a larger, the smaller foot, I can use that to size the bottom, to do a quick comparison. I also have a larger step on here, so I could use the same uh, screw chuck or screw mandrel for the larger uh, pieces like the, uh, the bishop or, or the queen that have a little larger larger base, so I don't even have to have a separate mandrel. Although, th these things, I have a bunch of them, because when you come to finish these things, whether you're dyeing it or putting on lacquer, whatever, it, it pays to have a bunch of these, so you can turn it at slow speed, uh, put your lacquer on there, set it aside, slap another one in there. And you don't have to go to all this much trouble fastening it on there. You can just kind of twist it onto that screw when you're doing your final finishing, whether it's applying dye or lacquer with a, with a brush, and it'll, it'll work just fine. So you get the idea. I don't think I'm going to take the time to actually turn, bog down and turn that piece. But that's the uh, a screw mandrel. I use something very similar for turning knobs. And here's another example, the one that I've got that uh, I made a screw chuck out of a threaded threaded glue block. I use a little larger screw. You want to use the screw that's appropriate for the uh, knob that you're going to turn. And again, this is a great, and then you're going to have to come in behind it and tighten it, tighten it up. Uh, so that's how that, that works. Let me show you a few pictures of some knobs. This is a storage unit I made for my work turning area, and I had to turn about 19 cherry knobs, uh, which is a lot of fun. Got my experience level up on turning knobs, and as a result, I was able to get an article published for American uh, Wood Turner on how to turn a knob. Here's a couple of more knobs I turned uh, out of uh, Bacote for a shop cabinet with some um, bovine ivory uh, inserts. Adds a little bit of extra. Uh, here's some similar knobs I turned out of Paduk for a storage unit uh, where I put my wood turning work again uh, with uh, some bone.
So I mentioned that I used my dog's bones, and one one of the ladies at at, at church kind of she approached me very carefully, like you you used your dog bones. I says no, it's bovine ivory. It means it's a cow bone that I stole from my dog after she chewed on it a while. So you just take a uh, a hacksaw or something, and you cut you out a piece as square as you can, drill a hole into a scrap of wood, put a little CA in there, and then you can turn this thing around and make these nice little beads and do a bunch of them one right after another uh, for those inserts. But nice way to kick up kick up your uh, your knobs. Here's an example of, of one I turned out of ivory, and this one's actually got a wood insert. Uh, this one doesn't mount with a screw. Uh, you drill a hole into into your drawer, put this in, and put a little wedge behind it to to hold it. That's kind of old style furniture making. And here's here's one that's got got a bovine bovine ivory. Another insert for making knobs. Uh, I forgot to pull it out. Again, another example of a threaded glue block is uh, tagawa. Uh, vegetable vegetable ivory. This thing was uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, vegetable ivory was used for all kinds of buttons. It's extremely hard. It's it's as used as an ivory substitute. Uh, but these things are about a uh, about a buck a piece. Oh, I didn't glue this one in, so I'm not going to turn it anyway. But that's the best way to mount it: is turn it between centers, make you a little tenon. Drill you a hole to match that tenon and then glue it in with some uh, CA glue. And then you can go to town on, on your Tagua. Talked about screw chucks. I, I, I mentioned uh, screw chucks. I didn't really talk about a woodworm screw uh, that comes with every chuck. And I really do like using a woodworm screw for bowls that do not require um, careful orientation of the grain. And that, that's very true on the ones that I make out of Bradford Pear, where the grain is pretty uh, almost non-existent. It's not doesn't tend to be real obvious. The trick with this thing is you've got to pay attention. And where did I put my... Well, unfortunately, I've got an extra extra one of these you want to pay attention to how it mounts in the chuck now in this case for your one way it's got a little round groove that matches up with the jaw carriers for the techno tool they're flat so you put the flat toward one of your numbered jaws tighten it up now here's the trick and it wasn't obvious to me i thought you pushed it back until it registered and I did that and lost a couple of bowls because I didn't know any better. The trick is you pull it forward. Now, if you read, if you read the documentation from Record Power, I kind of laughed. You know, it must have been written by some, some technical writer or engineer who didn't know any better. He said you push it back and tighten it. Well, common sense will tell you that if you're going to put a bowl on this, this thing and turning it, the, the forces are going to be pulling that screw out. So you want to go ahead and and pull it as far out as you can. So once you get it in place, I like to always use a little paraffin. I drill a hole on the on the uh, uh, drill press, but you can use a, a electric drill and drill a, the appropriate size a hole and, and put it on there, and it works great. Now here's a little trick. Part of the, stre the strength doesn't necessarily come from these screw threads. The strength comes from the friction on the front of your chuck. So how do you increase that friction? Well, you make you a little donut that that matches the front of those jaws, so you've got a much larger friction area. The other thing to, uh, that you can do is if you're doing platters, you don't have to have a full three-quarters of an inch. You can go a lot of times smaller than that and just put a little washer on there, and, and it'll work just, work just great. So woodworm screws are... Uh, often overlooked or unused or someone has a bad experience, kind of like turning a skew and getting a skate back, and it's like, whoa, I don't want to use that. That's too dangerous. Uh, the question is, understand how it's supposed to work. I like, I'm like. i a big believer in carefully reading and understanding the manufacturer's instructions and, and 
until I know enough to deviate. And I know enough to deviate from the record power instructions. They're flat wrong. I sent, <laughs> I sent Mike Davies. Some of y'all probably watching uh, Theo Haralampu and some of these other folks on the uh, uh, record powers uh, demonstrations periodically. Uh, so I, I sent Mike Davies a note and said, please pass this on. Y'all's documentation is just flat wrong. But what I found is, is even when it's wrong, they are not going to change it. It tends to be embedded, and they don't feel the need to to make a change. It's been my experience anyway. Um, uh, the, uh, one of the other chucking mechanisms is a, a friction chuck, and I make a distinction between a friction chuck and a jam chuck. A jam chuck is held with one end. You may use a um, uh, might be you might bring up your tailstock support as long as possible, which is a great idea. But ultimately, you can finish it off like I did without it. And here we okay, I'm going to put uh, a felt pad on the bottom of each of these so it doesn't scratch up my table, uh, dining room table. Uh, if you hadn't seen me do this in the episode on my uh, making chest men, I want to show you an easy way to cut that. Basically, I just fold a pad in half that's big enough with a square, and I'm going to place it up flat against this block in the appropriate size. Bring up a little tension, and this thing's going to flop around a little bit. I'm going to bring this out. Uh, a skew works well, but actually what I found out works best is... Uh, is a spindle gouge because it seems to cut the felt uh, shraps a little bit better. So we get that thing going at a pretty good speed and we're just going to come in here and there we have two perfectly round pads to glue on the bottom of our candlesticks. I made these Nutcracker Soldier uh, displays for my clubhouse and I wanted nostrils to look realistic and three-dimensional so I wanted to make, put a sphere on each side so I used an old technique of, of a paper joint and glued up a couple of blocks with carpenter's glue with uh, some brown paper between them. It could, it could be newsprint or uh, any kind of, kind of paper. I used the same technique a while back to replace a, a friend's uh, brace and uh, bit handle. So, so after it dries, uh, you, you trim it. I used a threaded glue block. This is a great technique for a block like this. I put a little carpenter's glue, let it dry a little bit on the end grain, uh, kind of a sizing, and then uh, a few minutes later, I add some glue to the glue block and clamped it on. Uh, it's not fully cured in an hour, but it's a tight bond original, so about an hour was, was plenty. So I turned the nose and the paper joint holds up just fine and then I part it off and then it's just a matter of, of taking a, a chisel and finding that seam and a quick pop along the, the, the joint and you're done. Works great. Lots of ways to hold a bowl on a lathe uh, to reverse it finish off the bottom including this commercial Longworth chuck. Uh, you can also uh, buy or make a a uh, donut chuck is, is this one is shown shown here. Uh, I'm not a real big fan of these, but I like a vacuum chuck. We'll talk about that later. You can also use uh, uh, cold jaws, uh, make your own, or uh, you can buy buy cold jaws and add wooden extensions. Uh, but the easiest way is just bring up tailstock support, work it down to a little bit of a nub, and then sure. cut it off the chisel. It's just a PVC pipe, again, on that threaded glue block with a little donut, wood-turned donut on, on the front with some closed-cell foam. They call fun foam around here. You can get it at various hobby shops. It's uh, about an eighth, a sixteenth of an inch thick. Works very well uh, to seal. Let me show you what my vacuum chuck system looks like. I didn't change cameras, but I will. 
I have my vacuum chuck pump mounted on the wall as shown here, a gas 523 on a French cleat. And here's the, uh, the gauge uh, where it goes up 29 pounds of, uh, or inches of mercury. It's got a bleeder valve, which is just a uh, brake, valve, uh, brake uh, filter. And here is my rotary adapter. Uh, uh, it's got a couple of bearings in it. It's at a uh, aircraft aluminum high speed. It's got a couple of nice uh, O-rings. So this will just pop right into my uh, hand wheel on my Pyromatic. Now, I've seen these people make these things out of lamp rod that come through here and seal here. They're a lot fussier. They're, they take longer to install, and you almost have to have one for every, every chuck. This thing just works great and seals perfectly well. And with two bearings, it will it will run all day long like a like a top. So I, I poke this thing in here. And now let me find something. This is a goofy demonstration, but it just goes, uh, it goes to show you what kind of strength if, if this stool will fit. Now I'm going to hold it while I, while I adjust the pressure. And I'm getting, I'm getting 23 pounds of pressure. Well, obviously, this is not going to work. I needed a smaller stool. But this thing will really, it, it's amazing how well this thing will, will hold. A bowl is generally no problem. It's got incredible strength. Now, the strength from this, from this vacuum, it's, Technically, it's not really a vacuum. It's pulling air, but it's the, it's the pressure. Some of you scientific types can probably explain this better than I can, but it's, it's the atmospheric pressure that's, that's holding this thing on here because this is a lower pressure behind it than here. The strength of it comes from the size of the chuck compared to the piece that you're, you're using. I made a variety of uh, chuck sizes, uh, large, medium, small, PVC body, uh, bodies for the most part on threaded glue blocks. But my favorite is this large flat one because uh, you put a bowl against it and you've got a large area under that bowl that creates quite a quite a powerful suction uh, hold. It's luxurious. Uh, I guess I ran out of things to play with early on because I, I, I got this thing with after I'd only been turning about a year because I like playing with things. And it and it wasn't really that expensive uh, with that buying that, that uh, pump on eBay. You just got to make sure that you got a pump that will pull enough cubic feet per minute. Uh, generally, that's four pounds, or I mean four cubic feet. Uh, four, yeah, four, four cubic feet per minute, I think, is, is, is the value that uh, I made one of these things. I went out... Um, the things you put on the end of a tailstock with with the three with the um, the one way and the pyromatic and big jet lathe and and robust makes one and um, somebody else I forget somebody else makes one the that has the three eighths inch by ten thread on it. I used a bolt a, a bolt. Uh, you see a number of people telling you to use bolts. Frankly, to me, this is more trouble than it's worth. I find it so much easier to just tap these things. Uh, I actually made a tap. I finally got around to buying one, uh, but I made one out of a out of a bolt from the hardware store. You just cut some grooves in it, and it worked fine for for cutting some of these fixtures that you put on the end here. What Eddie Castellan calls a soft touch, uh, but this one I happened to make out of a bolt. But it's it's got it's coved on this side with a piece of leather and and you just capture that sphere in between uh, and it works just works just great. So there's another example of uh, of a friction friction chuck.